All right. Welcome, everybody. And we might be uh, finishing a couple minutes earlier today, um, but I hope you've enjoyed everything. Got your got a, got a good lunch break in and everything. Um, and if you've been worried about a little bit more uh, heavier 1884, the good thing is I think we're going to learn a lot more about 1984 today more than anything in the next presentation. Is but uh, I'm excited to hear what he's what we've got going on. Um, our next right, uh, our next speaker is a travel and food writer based here in New Orleans. That's seen his work in the Times Picayune, the Gambit, and then nationally in the New York Times, um, among others. He's also the writer of. I did not know this, but reading your bio, you uh, wrote the Big King Cake book which uh, I think we sell at our store, the 1850 house as well. Um, Thank you. Uh, which which highlights 75 different king cakes, which I'm sure you enjoyed very much uh, trying and tasting. Your, your waistline, probably not so much, but definitely uh, I'm sure that was a fun time. So uh, our speaker, our next speaker is Matthew Haynes. He's going to be talking to us about the remains of 19, 1884 World's Fair and the 1980 World's Fair. Fair, World's Fairs, and he's going to tell us what is he, what is still here today, and uh, what you can go around and see on your own today. So I want to welcome Matthew Haynes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so excited to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited as well. Um, I have everything minimized, Jason. So if you if there are questions as we go or anything, feel free to stop me at any second. We can kind of you know do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You were. I'm, I'm, if someone comes in there with a question or something like that, I'll pop in there or something. Okay, great. And uh, I apologize in advance. I have a little bit of a cold. So if I have to stop to do, I'll mute myself and do a little nose blow or something like that. But hopefully, hopefully it won't come to that. Um, yeah, so I, um, I, most of my writing now is food, or maybe half my writing is about food. And so like Jason said, I uh, wrote the big book of King Cake. And then I wrote uh, the little book of King Cake right after, um, which you're from, if you're from New Orleans, maybe you've seen it around. And uh, right now I'm working on the big book of po' boy. So a lot of eating, uh, which requires a lot of running. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, I really, what I love about food writing is, um, or one thing that I love is celebrating local bakers and restaurants. Uh, but what I think I enjoy the most um, in these projects is learning about the history of these things that we still enjoy so much today. And so like specifically, I love how history leaves behind clues for us to uncover in our current world. And, and if I can use just one king cake example, um, you know, those of us who are New Orleanians or uh, about to begin enjoying carnival season, you know, a season that includes finding tiny plastic babies inside delicious round cakes. And um, as those of you from here know, whoever finds that plastic baby is crowned king or queen for the day, um, but they're also responsible for buying the next king cake. Um, and it's easy to think, wow, this is a tradition that we invented here um, or started maybe with the French not that long before here. Um, but kind of in the uh, theme of what we're going to talk about today, it's something, it's a custom that actually made its way through history, thousands of years of history, dating back all the way to the ancient Romans. And so during their Saturnalia festival, uh, they'd also have a round cake of their own uh, with something hidden inside it. And that something for them was a fava bean. And whoever found it was crowned king or queen of the Saturnalia, um, which is, you know, uh, parallel with what we have. However, uh, instead of having to bring the next cake in the early days of ancient Rome, the Saturnalia king of queen would actually be sacrificed to the gods. So much, much worse. Um, so anytime I see somebody complain about having to bring the next king cake, I, I remind them that, you know, they've got it easy. Uh, but, you know, that's just an example um, of how we can find history in our world today. And fortunately for us, the two New Orleans World's Fairs left us plenty of evidence uh, to find, uh, you know, in modern day New Orleans, as long as we know where to look. And um, I've enjoyed finding that evidence and I'm still continuing to find new things. So I'd like to share some of those with you. Um, and we're gonna start very general um, before getting specific. And so uh, because the 1884 Cotton Centennial's largest contribution to New Orleans, um, you know, we can start general because it's undoubtedly it's it's Audubon Park. Um, and at the time of the fair, uh, the park looked very different from the space we know today. Um, the land was, you know, once home to area American Indians and later to New Orleans first mayor, Etienne uh, de Bure, in the late 1700s. And before becoming mayor in 1803, he founded the nation's first commercial sugar plantation on the site, which was so big it included what's now, um, you know, in addition to Audubon Park and the zoo, it also included uh, the campus of Tulane University as well. 
And in his will, Bure left the massive space to public use. Um, and during the Civil War, it was used alternatively as a Confederate camp. And then after the North took over New Orleans, a Union hospital. Um, and then in 1866, it was an activation site for um, what we would know as Buffalo Soldiers. Um, but it wasn't until 1871 that New Orleans decided uh, the portion of the green space between the river and St. Charles would become an urban park. Um, and that idea, 1871, it sat there for a little bit, but it would finally be the World's Fair a decade later that provided the impetus to pursue the site's improvement needed to make that urban park uh, dream a reality. And so just so you have an idea, um, let's see here, this photo in the middle is, uh, is a government building on the site, um, which would have been, I know the map is small, but I think we're sending this over, it would have been in the corner of the park. Um, this is the Downriver side Exposition Boulevard, which we'll get to in a moment. And then this is St. Charles Avenue over here. Here's the river. So there's a government building. Uh, this photo over here is the main building, uh, but it's looking at it from this direction. So you can see the Mississippi River uh, behind it. Um, so Frederick Law Olmsted designed Central Park and is considered the father, yeah, designed Central Park and is considered the father of landscape architecture in the U.S. But it was his son, John Charles Olmsted, who in 1898 undertook his first, very first solo project for his family's design firm. And that project was Ottoman Park, which is now approximately 350 acres um, and enjoyed by hundreds of New Orleanians every single day, myself included. I go for runs there each day um, to try to keep those king cake and po' boy pounds off. And so um, Ottoman Park was created as we know it in the early 20th century. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Ottoman Zoo uh, was created as we know it in the early 20th century. Um, but it's worth noting that animal exhibits had been housed on that site um, since the 1884 World's Fair. So it would have been kind of over here. There would have been animals um, in different exhibits on site. Now, besides Ottoman Park itself, uh, there aren't too many specific examples in that actual space of that 1884 fair's existence. One that's still very much in use today, though, is known as Exposition Boulevard. Boulevard. In fact, if you go to Google Maps and type in Exposition Boulevard, comma, New Orleans, you'll see a small street that follows the entire eastern end or the downriver end of Audubon Park. Um, and then if you yourself go there, um, however, most of the so-called Boulevard is simply a sidewalk, um, which you can see in these two top pictures. Okay, just a little sidewalk, though here it's labeled, labeled right there, Exhibition Boulevard going from the river all the way to St. Charles Avenue. Um, back in 1884, it wasn't a sidewalk. It was a road paved with shells, allowing mule-drawn carriages to reach the entrance of the World's Fair, also known as the World Cotton Centennial, also known as the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition, hence Exposition Boulevard. And you can see, like I said, you can see the remnants of Exposition Boulevard right there. We use it every single day. Uh, one other bit of evidence still on the site from the 1884 World's Fair is this big hunking piece of rock, uh, which you can see right here. Some New Orleanians believe it's a human-sized piece of iron ore. Others believe it's a meteor. So what is this thing? You know, I'm not sure if you've ever seen that pass it a couple of times on jocks. Um, so uh, I found one article in 1881 from the Daily Picune. Uh, uh, the reporter wrote that a meteorite had crashed into the city before daylight. And the writer described the landing as, uh, as being loud enough to awake sleepers as far away as Biloxi, and Atlanta, shaking houses and breaking windows near the crash site in what is now obviously Audubon Park. And the reporter described uh, the extraordinary chemical composition of the meteorite, uh, quote, as the most wonderful phenomenon of the kind which has ever visited our, our Earth, end quote. Specifically since, again, quoting, uh, meteorites are of several different types, but in the great New Orleans wonder, all of these types are apparently combined. Okay, so this is some sort of spectacular meteorite um, that the uh, world had never seen before, landed right here in what would become our Audubon Park. Um, but at least a few readers took note of the date the article was published. Most most readers just believed it. Um, I mean, plenty of weird stuff happens in, in New Orleans, but at least a few readers took note of the date um, that the article was published, which was uh, April 1st or April Fool's Day. 
And so I'm not sure if this is what started the legend uh, that there's a meteor on the golf course at Audubon Park where the rock still sits to this day, um, or if it the, maybe the myth already existed and then the writer tried to create a joke around it. Um, but either way, generations of New Orleanians, uh, including you know to this very day, still call that the Audubon Park meteorite. Um, you know wh whether they whether they believe that or not, or know its actual origin or not. Um, at least they know that that legend, that's what they associated with. Um, so what is it, you know, actually? Well, uh, all 38 U.S. states at the time of the 1884 fair, as well as each territory other than Utah, which uh, makes me not a big fan of Utah anymore. Um, each of those states and territories other than Utah hosted exhibits at the fair showing off uh, what made them unique. And so part of the Alabama state exhibit included a mineral display. And when the World's Fair ended on June 1st, 1885, Alabama's representatives apparently forgot to pack up one notable object from that display, a piece of iron ore bigger than a human. And today the boulder sits in the middle of the park on the Audubon Park golf course and uh, finding it makes for a, a great scavenger hunt. All right, so those are the remnants that remain on site from the 1884 World's Fair, but there are several others that can be found around the city and beyond. Uh, one that I just learned about recently, for example, uh, was a gigantic pilcher-made organ, the largest in the world at the time. Um, it was at the Exposition's Music Hall, and uh, as you can see in this photo to the left, it's kind of up here. It's a, a packed house, and there's the organ kind of lording over all of it. Uh, you can see the organ in the back of a reception for Rex, you know, Rex of the famous Carnival crew. Um, one story says that when the giant organ was played inside the World's Fair building, it was so loud that it caused the main tent to collapse. To collapse. Um, then after the World's Fair closed, the organ was given to the Immaculate Conception Church on Barone Street, which is still located a half block upriver of Canal Street. Um, it was then, and it still is today. The first church on the site um, was completed in 1857, but then suffered extreme foundation damage in the late 1920s, um, not from the organ, from a different building being uh, built right next to it. Um, and so because of that damage, uh, they decided to uh, reconstruct the building from new, and uh, they moved the organ across the street uh, to the Roosevelt Hotel. Um, and then the uh, new church, which is basically just a replica of the old church, um, was put together back together in 1928 and 1929. And um, uh, when the organ, you know, the organ was was added back into the church, put back into use. And then over the years, the church decided to switch to a smaller organ and then eventually to a digital organ. Uh, but the original still there inside the building uh, with its 32 foot tall pipes. Um, though, as you can see from the, uh, the photo here on the right, it has seen uh, better days. Okay. Next up, um, so a terracotta company presenting at the World's Fair wanted to show what their material could do. And they displayed a statue um, and a monolithic base dedicated to one of the nine muses, Cleo, the goddess of history. And the work of art was appropriate, appropriately called Peace, the Genius of History. So that's what we're seeing right here, Peace, the Genius of History. And at the close of the fair, a local resident, George Dunbar, purchased the terracotta piece and donated it to the city. And the city placed a statue in a recently created park dedicated to local 19th century historian politician, Charles Etienne Arthur Gaillard, uh, who also happened to be the grandson of the previously mentioned Etienne de Bore, um, the original New Orleans mayor who owned the sugar plantation that would later become the site of the World's Fair and eventually Audubon Park. Um, but Gaillard Place is named after his grandson, Charles. It's this tiny park um, bordered by... Esplanade Avenue, Bayou Road, and North Tonti Street. And so think you're driving down Esplanade Avenue, you're driving away from the river, past Claiborne Avenue, under I-10, you're still on Esplanade Avenue and getting close to Broad Street, and suddenly a tiny road forks off from the Esplanade, and that's um, the very old Bayou Road. And uh, where those two roads split, you can find a little park with this statue. Um, the original statue was vandalized in 1938, and then was uh, replaced with a marble and cement version uh, that you can see here in this picture and you see today. However, the red terracotta base is the original from the Cotton Centennial. Okay, so 
an adult ticket for the uh, for a day to the 1884 World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition cost 50 cents. A children's ticket was 25 cents, and school children can get in for just 15 pennies. Uh, one of the double cast iron gateways that attendees might have entered through uh, is still um, around in New Orleans. Uh, you can find it on Elysian Fields Avenue as an entrance to the Hebrew Rest Cemetery Number no. 1, a Jewish cemetery located um, on Gentilly Ridge. And so if you're trying to find this, there are three Hebrew Rest Cemeteries right in the area, but this one is the one right on Elysian Fields. Um, most of the, the perimeter um, facing Elysian Fields is bordered with a cement wall, but that eventually gives way on both sides uh, to this beautiful historic entryway um, that was part of the 1884 World's Fair. Okay, unfortunately, not all remnants from the World's Fair are pleasant ones. And uh, even though this one looks, well, over here at least looks kind of pleasant. And so if you walked into the Japanese pavilion of the 1884 World's Fair, as so many people did, it said that you would have been gifted a beautiful looking, though unfamiliar plant known as a water hyacinth. And known for its attractive lavender blossoms, the plant was from the Amazon region of Brazil. So now, why the Japanese contingent at the fair were doling it out, I, I don't know, but uh, that's what was happening. And so most people say the hyacinth plants were given to visitors uh, to the Japanese, you know, any visitors to the Japanese, like a whole plant was given to them. Others say it was only seeds, but either way, today, this plant can be found in great numbers in many of Louisiana's bayous, and that's not a good thing. Uh, but first, before we get to that, how did it happen? And so uh, the way articles from the time account for it is that recipients of this gift either planted it or disposed of it. But either way, um, the hyacinth would, uh, which infamously multiples at like alarming rates, um, has created a problem we're still dealing with today because after multiplying, the plant creates this impenetrable barrier and not only does that make it nearly impossible to navigate the waterways in which the water hyacinth grows, but it also blocks sunlight from reaching plants below the surface and suffocates fish by depleting their oxygen. And so, you know, you could see a picture here in the middle of uh, a waterway becoming not navigable. But I remember even got a, a decade ago, it might still be the case now in um, uh, Jean Lafitte National Preserve, you can't take a kayak on many parts of it because of it being blocked by this plant. And so volunteer groups have worked at removing the invasive species from Bayou St. John, but even touching the plant causes part of it to break off, which spreads its seeds and makes it grow again at these alarming rates. And so more intense spreads have taken place in City Park, Jean Lafitte National Preserve, and many uh, more of Louisiana's waterways uh, dating back again to this World's Fair 140 years ago. <laughs> so there are also a few relics from the 1884 World's Fair that remain on display outside of the Crescent City. And so we'll touch on a couple of those. Um, of particular note, the Philadelphia Liberty Bell, um, originally created in 1753, made a guest appearance at the Cotton, Cent Cotton Centennial. Um, now, remember, the exposition was taking place less than two decades after the Civil War. So one objective of the fair was to show the world, as well as our own country's northern states, that there was a new South. You know, focused on progress and building manufacturing uh, might instead of hanging out onto like racist old ways of thinking. And so even for their part, the northern states were also interested in showing other countries that reconciliation was well underway and that the United States of America was a strong ally and a good investment. So sending the Liberty Bell to New Orleans for part of the World's Fair was Pennsylvania's way of doing that. Okay. The uh, Bankers Pavilion uh, wasn't finished being built until approximately two months after the World's Fair had already opened. Um, a story published on February 8th, 1885 in the Daily Picune said that the pavilion was built by local architect Thomas Sully, quote, for the comfort of visiting and resident bankers while at the exposition. Um, it's designed as a blend of Italianate, Queen Anne, East Lake, and Asian-inspired architecture. The building on, sat on what you know, today was the park's golf course. Uh, but once the fair closed, the building was sold, this building right here, placed on a barge and shipped to Port Allen in West Baton Rouge Parish. 
And there it became the main building of the Poplar Grove Sugar Plantation, uh, though it's undergone several renovations and changes in the following century plus. Um, and, and in 1987, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places because of its architectural importance. And you can still visit that today. Okay, and one final one to look at from the 1884 World's Fair. Hmm. Let me try one thing here, I might have. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, I may have lost the slide here, but we'll try it one more time. We've seen this a couple of times and this would be really neat to see if we can try it, we can get this working. Yeah, sure, okay. Let me uh, let me do the text for it. I'll give the context and then I'll, okay. I'll give it. Um, so one of the 1884 Constantinople's finest buildings was from Mexico, uh, created to house you know, their exhibit. And wasn't particularly large, but the design uh, in what was called the Neo Mudejar style, popular in the 19th, in 19th century Spain, was eye-catching, as you can you know, see here. And engineer Jose Ramon uh, Iberola is credited with the octagonal building topped with a glass cupola. Um, it's a wealth of or its wealth of intricate Moorish decorative flourishes earned it the nickname the Alhambra Palace uh, after the famous Moorish landmark in Granada, Spain. And uh, at the exposition, the inside house uh, displays of various minerals mined in Mexico, but it was the structure itself that stole the show. And fortunately, the building was constructed uh, mostly of cast iron panels, and this meant it could be disassembled easily, moved, and then reassembled in a new location. And it's probably this feature which explains how it also same building made an appearance at the St. Louis 1902 World's Fair and how it's now a nar national artistic monument in Mexico City, known there as El Kiosco Morisco or the Moorish Kiosk. And um, the kiosk is the centerpiece of a park in Mexico City's Alameda Park. Uh, for a time, it was the site of drawings for Mexico's national lottery, but today it's a Mexican national treasure and one of the most elaborate and enduring relics of, rel uh, relics of New Orleans' 1884 World's Fair. And so um, I wanted to show a couple of seconds of this video so you can kind of see how it still appears to be uh, enjoyed uh, to this day. And so let me, hopefully the sound's gonna share. Let's give it a whirl. El kiosco Morisco se ubica en el barrio tradicional de Santa María. So you get an idea at least how it's used in a bunch of different ways and how it's really a centerpiece of this park. And I think it's fun to think about how just like, you know, just like us with many of the treasures in our own city, many of those residents enjoying the structure each day probably don't know the history and that it once sat in 19th century New Orleans, you know, worthy of a mention in a symposium, a symposium about World's Fairs. It's kind of fun. Um, all right, let's see how I can get myself to the next slide. La Rivera. Hmm. Give me one moment to figure this out. Hmm. I stuck myself. Sorry, everyone. Can you hit the escape button? Oh, good idea. Let's try that. There we go. All right, I can probably get myself back now. Have I stopped sharing completely now? You have. So what you're going to do is you're going to hit the screen that you're on and then hit the green button at the bottom that says share screen. Okay, okay. And then it'll it'll go back to that, to your PowerPoint and click that. All right, so let me try to... I got my... Uh... Hmm. Sorry. Trying to reshare the uh so hit um, hit your like hit your face on the zoom. And my I've actually hidden all of that. <laughs> Jason, do you mind if I call my girlfriend in real fast? To, no, no, that's perfectly okay. fine. Yeah. Call sure. the tech support in. All right, I'll get her one second. Hold Sorry. on one second, everybody. We'll get this all worked out. Thank you. We're about to go to 1984. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Mariana Rodriguez, my technical support. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, what needs to be done? Um, so I had to, when I got done with the video, 
Yeah. But, um, I just need to get the PowerPoint back as the focus and then share the screen again. Got it. Okay. That's what I just the PowerPoint is showing. Okay. Jason, did the sound work okay when I shared? Yeah, we could hear the music and everything. Yeah, I've got a couple more videos, but I'm afraid to do them. <laughs> <laughs> just when you, after you finish the video, just double click. Double click. And it goes to the next slide. I'll give it a whirl. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. So that was the 1884 World's Fair. Now, obviously, there's going to be more evidence from the 1984 World's Fair. So I, started, I tried to just select. Uh, some of them uh, today, you know, just much like in 1884, the the, the Audubon Park was a major uh, uh, result of us hosting that fair. Uh, for the 1984 World Fair, was the Warehouse District. Um, today, it's a lively, you know, it's lively and full of art galleries, restaurants, bars, and clubs. But prior to the 1884 World Fair, uh, these were trash-strewn streets in disrepair, surrounded by old, decaying warehouses. Fulton Street is, um, which you can see kind of in this picture down here, is one of the most noteworthy examples of that transformation. Um, but by all accounts, this was not a street you'd want to hang out on uh, before the mid-1980s. Uh, but many of the neighborhood streets were repaired leading up to approximately, uh, leading up to the approximately 84-acre fair. Um, it was the newly created Fulton Street Mall that was built as the, centers, uh, the center of World's Fair nightlife. Um, and the positive, which you can see kind of up here on this map. Um, the positive results of that investment can still be seen today. Um, the fund has shifted down a few blocks toward Poitras Street. So the center of that mall was a little further away from Poitras Street. Now it's kind of abutting Poitras Street, um, but residents and tourists still enjoy, you know, the pedestrian friendly Fulton Alley featuring Harris Casino, Manning Sports Bar, Ernst Cafe, other bars, a bowling alley, and, and more. Uh, several of the buildings and sites built and revitalized for the World's Fair remain in use today. Uh, so the Festival Park area of the fair, which is up here in the blue, uh, was anchored by the Federal Fiber Mills building, which you can see here. Uh, which housed the German beer garden and uh, uh, the pretty well-known Jed's Lookout over the Mississippi. You know, so it's a place you can go to look out over the Mississippi River. And today the building is the Federal Fiber Mills Condominium. So even though it's pretty far, a couple of blocks from the river, you can see how you know would provide a pretty good viewpoint up there. Um, as you know by now, I'm sure World's Fairs feature pavilions hosted by countries from around the world. Uh, the current Hyatt Place Hotel, for example, is on the site of what was then the Vatican City Pavilion. Uh, similarly, the New Orleans Pavilion is occupied by the Omni River Hotel. And, and most of the international pavilions uh, were along a section of the fair called the International Waterfront, and that's down here. Um, after the event, those pavilions were redeveloped into their current use and one of the exposition's most enduring remnants, um, the Riverwalk Mall, uh, which you can also see from the non-river side in this picture. Um, and in digging into this photo uh, for a second, uh, even parking lots carry history. And so what we know today as the whale lot, a lot of people call it the whale lot, named because of the undersea mural created by artist Robert Wyland after the fair closed. And so you can see that mural right there. Um, uh, was once centrally located, uh, the centrally located Centennial Plaza. The plaza sat just inside the main city gate entrance to the fair and featured an aquarium, petroleum-related demonstration, gondola and monorail stations, live old timely music, and more. Um, and I think perhaps most amazing uh, was the view from if you were standing in this parking lot or what's now this parking lot, because if you stood at a certain location in the plaza, the World's Fair buildings would align just right to look like the main hall from the 1884 exposition. And so they designed it that way that if you stood in a very specific place, you'd see that uh, um, that view from 100 years earlier, which I think is so cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there are the photos <laughs> that I meant to have from the uh, uh, 
the Mexican, the, the building from before. Uh, but you can see here it is in the context of, uh, you know, of, of uh, photos from uh, 1884. And then here it is today. Okay. So for years before um, the World's Fair, city officials talked about building a convention center. Uh, the 1880, the 1984, sorry, event provided the catalyst. You know, having a convention center that could compete with other cities like Houston and Atlanta, that's what they wanted. And so what is now halls A, B, and C of the Ernest N. Memorial Convention Center started as the 300,000 square foot Great Hall, an air conditioned, mercifully, indoor facility that was home to many of the fair state and corporate exhibits. Most popular among, among them was the Louisiana exhibit featuring an indoor Disney-esque boat ride. And, you know, even today, a section of the convention center is known as the Great Hall, which if you can see in this photo, it's still listed as the Great Hall. If you want to go to the Great Hall, follow, go to your left. Um, the convention, convention center has expanded repeatedly since 1984. Uh, what was once the fair's Bayou Plaza neighborhood uh, with water-centric attractions like the Kid Wash and Aquacade is now convention center's Con convention center hall is DENF, for example. Okay, so there were two public entrances to the 1984 World's Fair. The city gate, um, surrounded by a buxom pair of topless mermaid sculptures, received most of the attention, uh, to the point that more conservative New Orleanians wanted the statues removed. It was the other gate, however, the bridge gate, that boasts the more enduring legacy. And so the bridge gate was located on what is now Convention Center Boulevard in the shadow of the Crescent City Connection Bridge. Um, sculptures also surrounded this gate, including oversized alligators, uh, a more modest mermaid than the other gate, and King Neptune, the god of war. And these pieces of art were created by artist Blaine Kern of Kern Studios, a company that's created Mardi Gras floats for nearly 90 years. And today you can still find two of the bridge gate sculptures, uh, the head of the alligator, and a tridentless Neptune sit on the corner of Chapatools and Henderson Streets, not too far from where they would have been located during the festival. Uh, now, however, they point the way to Blaine Kern's Mardi Gras world, as you see in this photo. So this is from back then. And then here they are today. One of the fair's most popular attractions was the Mississippi Aerial River Transit, uh, or MART. And this uh, quote unquote ride was actually a public transit solution, a gondola lift that took fairgoers on the 2200 foot journey uh, from the warehouse district across to a small number of attractions on the West Bank uh, and then back. Of course, that meant the gondolas traversed the Mississippi River at almost 350 feet in the air. Um, and by most accounts, this was a terrifying journey, uh, particularly on a windy day. In fact, it was considered one of the two best thrill rides in the U.S. on many lists from the time, sometimes sharing top honors uh, with Disney's, Disney's Space Mountain. Um, adding to the thrill, uh, the more than 50 individual gondola cars were notorious for getting stuck, leaving poor riders dangling over one of the world's biggest rivers until it could be fixed. Uh, more than 1.7 million riders enjoyed, or if not enjoyed, at least took the memorable trip. Um, and after the fair, the idea was to keep Mart as an alternative transportation across the river to the bridge, um, you know, as opposed to the bridge or ferries. Uh, but ridership was low and the gondola shut down for good in April 1985. Um, there were plans to reopen the system, but they never materialized and the gondolas were auctioned off in 1989. Uh, these prizes can be found in, in private res residences and even on, in hunting cabins far from New Orleans, but at least one still remains close by. Gondola number 26, which you see right here, um, can be found and still largely intact outside of Nesbitt's Poe Fair Street Market in the warehouse district on Poe Fair Street between Annunciation and Constant Streets. I think it would be really fun to hunt down each of the gondola cars. Uh, so if you know of any, uh, let me know. Tip me off. Okay. I really want to show this video, but I'm afraid to do it. Uh, but we'll give it a whirl because Marianne is right here. Um, so for our viewing pleasure, I've pulled a part of a trailer from the 1985 film uh, called French Quarter Undercover, starring Michael Parks as Detective Andre Des Moines, uh, Elliot Keener as Boudreau, and Susan M. Regard as Princess. And on most rating systems, the movie's rated about four to 10, which I think will feel obvious to you when you see the trailer. 
uh, but I think I have it queued up to the part where our World's Fair gondolas feature. So let's give it a whirl. I forgot to mention the only trailer I could find was in German, I think. Michael Parks and Bill Holiday. Diese beiden Bullen, Amerikas härteste Spezialkommen. New Orleans Anti-Terror Force. Jetzt in ihrer Videothek. Hope you love that as much as I did. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So running nearly the entire length of Convention Center Boulevard was the Wonder Wall. Um, which you can see in its entirety in this smaller picture here, and you can kind of see from an angle here. Um, it's designed by noted architect Charles Willard Moore and his partner, William Trumbull, or I'm sorry, Turnbull. Uh, Moore was also one of the artists behind Piazza d'Italia, um, which is in the CBD where Poydras and Chapatula Street meet. And it's uh, a very, it's a, there's an entire history to that in and of itself, which is worth exploring. Uh, but Wonderworld, Wonderwall served the purpose of camouflaging ugly high tension power lines along Convention City Boulevard, but it ended up being a memorable highlight for fairgoers. And so the Wonder Wall was a half mile long smattering of bombastic sculptures, scaffolding, architectural forms and landscaping that one writer described as, quote, the Great Wall of China a la Harpo Mar Marx. Um, so like many of the fair's attractions, the wall was disassembled and sold following the event's closing, though some evidence still can be found around town. Several of the Wonder Wall silver leaf sculptures, which you can see in this photo right here, are in the waterfront facing backyard of a resident living on Demorales Island along Bayou St. John. And you can best see them uh, you know, from the trail between Wisner Boulevard and Bayou St. John near Harrison Avenue. You can also see it from the Harrison Avenue bridge going over the bayou. Um, they look very nice. You can see them from the bayou if you happen to be paddling. Uh, also, just an aside, if you haven't visited Demorales Island, uh, while you won't be able to see the sculptures from the island itself because it's in the backyard, it's still a really interesting place to walk or drive around for a few minutes because of the unique mid-century modern architecture. Okay, The 1984 World's Fair was split into six neighborhoods that I've already kind of mentioned a couple of them. And uh, fortunately, for those tired of walking, a 1.5 mile monorail zipped through five of those neighborhoods on an elevated track, uh, even passing directly through several of the pavilions. Um, a complete circuit took about 12 minutes, so the monorail was a great way for fairgoers to get their bearings before jumping into the celebration by foot. Um, the long-term plan for this $15 million transit addition was to provide improved public transportation through sections of the C CBD. But after the fair went bankrupt, uh, the monorail was sold to the Miami Zoo where it was in use until 2022. Uh, I'm not sure what's in store for the monorail next or if it's retired for good, um, but we do have this tiny little video that's not quite as exciting as the, as the last one, but you can see it in action at least. There's our uh, repurposed uh, monorail. Okay, so the 1984 World's Fair uh, had a water theme called the World of Rivers, Fresh Waters as a Source of Life. And uh, winners of an international art competition based on that theme were scattered throughout the exposition. Uh, several of those still exist in New Orleans today. Uh, one of the uh, first that many attendees would have seen was a gigantic head on its side with water leaking from its eyes. And that work of art uh, was called Crying Head and was designed by Claude and Francois Xavier, I'm sorry, Francois, Francois Xavier Lalonde. 
and can be found today on the Elk Place Neutral Ground, uh, downtown between Cleveland Avenue and Canal Street, um, just a couple of blocks downriver of the public library downtown. And so, um, yeah, just imagine being on Elk Place, about a half a block upriver of Canal Street, and you'd see it right there. And while the sculpture is not doing so great in this photo, I heard it's been cleaned up recently, so I need to check that out and confirm, but it might uh, have better days ahead. Okay, and another work of art at the festival was The Wave of the World by Linda Bengli. Um, an article by the Times Picune described the Lake Charles born artist as, quote, um, an art world radical who pioneered audacious sculptural techniques as she made feminist strides in a male dominated profession, end quote. Uh, that profession obviously was sculpture and her bronze work of art was located inside what is now the convention center during the fair. But a series of mix-ups and mishaps after the fair closed resulted in this award-winning piece of art getting lost. So um, after the fair, an art-loving resident of Kenner purchased the piece for $100,000. Again, that's back in the 1980s. Um, it was sent to Monaco to go on display for a bit of time. Uh, but then when it returned to Louisiana, uh, it sat, uh, it, it was meant to go on display in Kenner outside. Um, but the piece wound up accidentally lost in a former Kenner sewage treatment plant, like for decades, it was just lost. And an article I read said that workers at the treatment plant would just every, every day, they were just eating their lunch like any of us would do, but they were just eating it underneath this award-winning, at this point now, probably multiple hundred thousand dollar um, sculpture in a warehouse, having no idea what it was. And so years later, once the immense value of the piece was realized, it was restored and now is on loan along Big Lake in City Park near the Esplanade Avenue entrance to City Park. Okay, and then one more. Um, so the 1984 World's Fair had a profound effect on the food our restaurants serve to this day. It's hard to believe, but there was a time when crawfish was rarely eaten outside the bayous of Cajun country. Um, it would be rare to see it here compared to now at least. And so uh, due to new harvesting methods, um, the now popular crawfish made inroads in New Orleans just in time for the World's Fair. Um, so those harvesting methods in combination with the rise of Paul Perdome and his new book, uh, Chef Paul Perdome's Louisiana Kitchen, gave food writers at the, at the fair lots to talk about. And they penned articles um, read around the country and around the world about Cajun and Creole food, uh, crawfish and beyond. Uh, which soon inspired travelers to come to New Orleans for its unique regional cuisine um, or cuisines. Uh, local chefs obliged uh, like uh, these uh, these travelers who wanted these dishes. And so they put them uh, on menus more frequently and we'd see them more and more around the city. And they started to be mixed with the already present Creole dishes that were here. And so the coverage of the food at the World's Fair also helped popularize Creole and Cajun food around the world. Um, the effects of this, obviously, if you have traveled outside the city or outside the state, um, can be seen today as uh, there are Cajun restaurants in seemingly every corner of the world. Every place you travel, you see a Cajun restaurant or at least like Cajun seasoned fried chicken or sandwich or something like that. Um, so those are the ones that I've chose to focus on today. Um, I know we don't have too much time for questions, but I'd love to take some if anybody does, or if anybody has any input or things that they feel like I missed. And thank you for listening. Yes, I appreciate um, it. Matt, that was a, a fantastic presentation. And uh, honestly, I'm I'm blown away by uh, how many, um, let me stop the sharing there. I can, there we go. Uh, sure. No, I got it. And uh, how many of the 1884 stuff is still around? I've always heard that there was very little there. And I want to point out in our chat, um, if you would like to buy a monorail cart, I mean, not a monorail, a gondola cart, you can buy one on Facebook Messenger right now for $2,000. Oh, my God. For a cart right now. Uh, <laughs> I think it was it was in Harvey. You can go get it. Do I want to buy one? <laughs> That's a good question. I <laughs> We're going to all out. Um, yeah. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first thing was, I was like, how did you, how was your research process for this done? And uh, uh, Emily Perry says, you do want to buy it. Okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, You're over the edge. I'm going to do it. <laughs> the 
talk, can you talk a little bit uh, when you, because originally your uh, the way I found out about your research on this was that I saw a smaller article on this, but this is a, you've done a much bigger presentation for us, which I thank you very much. But how did you get uh, doing, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the research of this? Yeah. I mean, so uh, I would say I am, uh, I'm a king cake expert. I'm becoming a po'boy expert. I would, I think there's a lot of people who know a lot more about the world's fairs than I do, though. I think they're incredible. I enjoyed doing the research for these articles, but there was so much left. I only get so many words I can write for the article. Yeah. Uh, you guys gave me a very generous 45 minutes. So, yeah. um, so I, um, you know, just kind of went back to some of those old sources. I mean, there's amazing podcasts on this, uh, incredible articles from that time. You know, you can kind of compare, uh, you know, uh, newspaper articles from the late 1800s or from 1984, obviously a lot easier and kind of try to figure out, um, you know, where the overlap is geographically. And, um, and then it, I don't know, I love the idea. Uh, it's time consuming, but trying to hunt down where like, so I would, for example, where these gondolas, uh, where the cars ended up going um, would be such a fun and not impossible thing to do. Just take some time. Um NOLA.com did great work. They have some great articles um, and some maps from uh, the, eight, the 1984 World's Fair. Uh, the 1884 World's Fair is a little a little trickier. There's like for, for the 1884 stuff, it was a lot of like people who are just passionate about the World's Fairs from, from those times. Uh, from the 1984 one, it's a lot of people who... I think for a lot of people who were born here, it's just a thing they remember. And so it's fun for them to kind of think about how that uh, the the warehouse district has changed over time based on that. And so, yeah, but I mean, for me, uh, it always starts with a podcast while I'm jogging or just reading some easily accessible newspaper articles or talking to some people who are experts and doing some interviews myself. And then, um, it always ends up with me in the like on the library's uh, database of old articles, just hunting down keywords in every specific iteration I can possibly do it. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I wonder if I was thinking this, uh, I got a lot of phone calls. I even got offered some things from the 84 World's Fair, 1984 World's Fair for this symposium. Do you still get contacted about it since you since you since you put out your article? Not that much. I'm trying to think of anything. Oh, no, that's a, it's, it's mostly I'll get maybe, uh, I'd say every two months or something, I'll get an email from somebody saying like, ah, oh, don't forget about this. Or did he, oh, I've got these great pictures of the Alabama State uh, uh, exhibits mineral um, uh, collection from the 1884 World's Fair. And they, they do have a great picture from that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'll get like some people who are just very passionate about this spe specific topic, which I mean, I think is I think it's is great. I love talking to people like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the cut. The, it just reminded me the the plant, the Japanese plant that uh, has kind of taken over in these areas. Um, it, it reminded me of kudzu, which has you know uh, taken over a large part of our area, and specifically in Alabama and Georgia, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Was that plant an invasive species in Japan as well? And, you know, because it seems like that's kind of a bad idea to bring that plant if you know it's already invasive. <laughs> I agree. I was trying to look into that and I kind of just, uh, uh, I, I didn't make it as far as I wanted to. But yeah. um, I know a lot of the pictures of it as an invasive, like when you look at photos of it um, making it impossible for boats to navigate waterways, there's more of them from Asia than there are from Louisiana. And so I, I think it's a pretty big deal there. As far as how it got to Japan, I did not get that far um, yet. I just noted that I was like, well, that's weird that they have it um, because um, it's uh, in a certain latitude in, uh, in South okay, America. Yeah. yeah, so mm -hmm. how it ended up there is a, is a great question. Yeah. Oh, so it wasn't native to Japan? I don't believe so. Nothing okay, I saw that said that sorry, it was, I, I got confused there on that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nothing that I saw said that it was native to Japan. It got there somehow. And actually, even even when you like see debates of how uh, the water hyacinth got to New Orleans, almost everybody says it's um, either through those the basically what I said the the plants or as seeds um, yeah. through the World's Fair. But there are some people who say. Um, without much evidence, as far as I can tell. Uh, no, a New Orleanian went to Chile 
and uh, grabbed the plant there and brought it home to plant in their garden. And then it blew up from there. Um, so I don't know, this, the, the World Fair um, version seems much more widely reported. Um, but also, I've always heard that the kudzu plant came here because we in World War II we had had a lot of we had a lot of uh, ships that came back and forth and just naturally over time oh. you know, some's going to land here and so maybe that's a, that could have been something like that. I mean, if you're bringing bananas or stuff from from Latin America, I mean, you're going to bring some you know native plants to them that are eventually going to land here. Unfortunately, so maybe that's how that got there. Yeah, and it sounds um, like it did not take much for it to uh, to spread. It's like a it's a quick moving thing. Um. One last question. Nancy says, do you have a list of these locations? Have you ever put together a map of maybe of them? Yeah, I, I thought about putting a map actually together for this presentation. And then I thought my PowerPoint was getting kind of like the uh, the slides were getting crowded. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided just to try to explain them very well. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to, to try to do that. Uh, I've got it pretty easy to do. So I can I can give that a whirl. Um, I, I know that who um, the 1884 World's Fair one, I can I'll hang around. I'll put it in the uh, comments like an old New Orleans online blog or something, they took a stab at doing something like that for the 1884 World Fair. And, and actually they only did it based on things that are still in the park. Um, and so even if those things are no longer there, so they were talking about things so a little bit different than what we're doing here today, but still really interesting for somebody who would want to see that map. But I, I, can, I can put something together. It might take me a little bit of time. That's but, okay. Take your time. Yeah. Take your time. But anybody can go back and they'll be able to watch this for a couple months afterwards. See, Charles says the kudzu was planted in the New Deal 1930s to provide soil stability in the American South, uh, brainstormed by the USDA, but they didn't realize it would grow inches per day. I oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. That that answers that question right there. Um, and the last thing is I wanted to point out, uh, it was mentioned also that the, the monorail uh, was unfortunately decommissioned in 2022 by the Miami Zoo uh, because they ran out of parts because the the company that that created it uh, went out of business in 1987 and so they decommissioned one. <laughs> I, I saw they had a whole press release on this. The Miami Zoo did, yeah. um, and they had um, and you can just Google Miami uh, Mon Miami Zoo monorail and I was doing it as you were talking and yeah. and. Uh, they had to decommission one of them in 1987 uh, to use as parts for the next, you know, uh, 35 years, which provided them enough parts. And then by 2022, it was they said it was going to be more expensive for them uh, to kind of create parts than it was to uh, than, than it was to uh, keep it going. Now you can uh, it did say you can purchase a per, uh, you can rent a VIP golf cart now. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> not as exciting the golf cart ride. No, but... not not nearly as exciting. It's Plus, it does say that that people love the monorail because it was air conditioned and mm -hmm. it's so warm down there. So as it is here, so a golf cart is just not going to it's just not going to provide you that cooling off that you get there. Yeah. So, Matt, I want to thank you so much. You provided an unbelievable story for us to keep following. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your lecture. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for having me. And if anybody comes up with anything else uh, that I missed or any of these other gondola rides, please uh, email me and I will, uh, it's on my website and uh, I would love to, I'm always, always searching for more. So thank you. It's matthaines.com or matthaineswriting.com? Uh, matthaineswrites.com. Yeah. Writes.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we've got um, our speakers already in here for our next one. So I'm just going to put everybody in the wait room and then I'm going to very quickly put you back in uh, and then get us back in it and we'll get started in probably about five minutes. So Matt, thank you so much. We'll see thank everybody you, in a couple Thanks minutes. Bye-bye. And thank you to your girlfriend for helping us out. I think she can hear us right now, so I will, uh, I don't even have to talk. <laughs> Thank Bye you. Guys.